I am absolutely in awe of all of the speakers that we've had here today. I'd just like to say that, and it's an honor to be here. Um, I want to start off by saying that I have never been in a boy band. <laughs> and also, I wanted to add to that is the, um, there were a couple of, at lunchtime today, um, I, I walked out and a couple of people told me that they really, really enjoyed my presentation. <laughs> And so, to distinguish myself from the two devastatingly handsome, bald, gray-haired men <laughs> who presented this morning, <laughs> this is as close to being in a boy band as I will ever be. <laughs> Small events in our lives can have major impact on the people that we become. Small events in our lives can have major impact on the people that we become. I think of life sometimes in terms of shouts. And shouts are these events that occur, and they're major events in our lives. And we realize at the time that they're major events. The birth of a child, the death of a parent, we, we just know right at the time that they're going to have a profound long-term effect on us. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about whispers. And what whispers are, are very small events. And they're small events that occur that are seemingly insignificant at the time, but they have a profound influence. They, they change us, and sometimes we don't even discover that until six or seven years after the event. Let me give you an example of a shout. This is a shout from last fall. My daughter was in a car accident with a drunk driver. She's here today. She's perfectly fine. Um, the bad man went to jail, and the car went to the junkyard. And from a parent's standpoint, that's the optimal resolution. Right? Now let me talk about a whisper that had profound influence on my life. I don't know if any of you are aware of how a uh, quadriplegic child communicates with a computer. But this is a device that I saw six or seven years ago that makes that happen. And if you look, picture one is a camera that's sitting on the top of the screen pointed towards the forehead of the child. Um, picture two is metallic dots. And they take one of those metallic dots and they place it on the forehead of the child every morning. All right, so mouse motion is just the, the limited mobility that the child has in their neck. And they move their neck around, and that's how they get mouse motion. And then picture three is a zipper puffer. And a zipper puffer is inhale, means left mouse, and exhale, means right mouse. And that's how a quadriplegic child works with a computer. And I, I toured this facility with somebody from our local school district who works with kids who have cognitive and physical disabilities. And, our, our, and she works with what are the equipment that they need in order to get through a, a normal day of school. When I walked out of there, I, I thought about this equipment that this quadriplegic child uses to communicate with a computer. And I thought, if anybody on the planet deserves to play a fantasy computer game, it's the child who can't get out of their own body. And I thought, you know, the distance between a, a, a dot on the forehead and a zipper puffer and a game controller is just a huge, huge distance. And you know, I thought about that in the back of my mind, and I didn't do much about it. And then I, was, I, I work at a senior capstone class, trying to create a class that you know, students get together and they create something meaningful. And I thought, well, maybe I can do something there. And so I built this approach into my class. And the approach goes like this. Students, every student in the class proposes a game idea. We, we, we start off with you know, some new technology, some disability that we're focusing on, and every student in the class proposes. They make pitches to a group of experts. They're health experts, they're technology experts, and they're the ones that say they give thumbs up or thumbs down to projects that are going to live. The students work for the rest of the semester, and they build the games. They actually construct them. They work in teams of maybe three to five, maybe six students in order to build the games. Um, we test the games on an audience of people with the disabilities just to see how they work and how they respond to the games. Um, I try to, to the best of my ability, offer internships or independent studies to the students so that they continue development. And then we hope, we're, we're trying to form a company right now, 
where we actually commercialize these products. And the idea of any revenues that we generate from these products will be turned around to buy assistive technology for kids who can't afford them. So we're trying to, you know, if we can build a company, if we can commercialize this, then perhaps we can give something back. What I want to do is show you a couple of projects that some students worked on. This is a student team that I had, and they built a, um, an app. This is what the app looks like. They built an iPad app for folks with cerebral palsy to be able to send and receive texts and emails. Uh, and they built it, and it was, it was really an interesting project on the class, and they entered into a comp bunch of competitions, and they won prizes. They won several national prizes. They won several international prizes, and they won over $100,000 in money to continue development. And that was significant, right? And we weren't necessarily even planning on success. We just thought, let's have some interesting projects. And these students just punched it out of the park. Another project that we've worked on recently is this game called Path. And in Path, uh, what you do is you develop these different patterns that you're trying to follow. I, if you notice, there's a block M in the upper left-hand corner. And you, you follow these paths with your right hand or with your left hand. Um, you can follow them with your knees. You can follow them with your heads. But we still have the issue of, of how do we recognize that that motion is going on. And fortunately for us, the Microsoft Connect sensor was developed. How many of you, anybody play Microsoft Connect at all? OK, wonderful sensor. So we can use it for gaming, but we can also use it for therapy of assessment for people with disabilities. And that's what we found, is that we could use this, this brilliant technology in a way that was unanticipated to help for assessment of therapy of disabilities in children. And then we also found after this is that we originally intended this to be for uh, the, the original audience that we intended this for was kids with autism to work on large motor skills. And then we actually found that it has uh, potential effect for stroke victims, for kids with brachial plexus palsy. So we have all of these other potential applications of this. An interesting question is what's next? And the joy of what I do for a living is that I don't know what's next. Um, we throw different technology into the sandbox every academic year. And I have a couple examples up here. There's a, a leap motion device that measures fine motor skills of somebody's hands, and you can simulate different things with their hands. And this, this device at the bottom uh, is an Intel camera. And they want to use it for facial recognition, for security, and logging on to a system. And we thought, well, if you can recognize different facial features, then perhaps you can recognize an ear twitch, or a nose flare, or mouth motion, or eye motion. And that maybe we actually can get to the point that we can use these devices to simulate some kind of gaming controller. And what disability are we going to focus on next? I don't know. And that's the richness, is that we can come up, we can talk with folks at U of M Health Systems, we can talk with great companies like Microsoft and Apple about what new technology, and we can use it in ways that they never even thought about. So this little whisper of visiting this location, going and touring these facilities for kids with cognitive and physical disabilities, led to lifelong research for me. Lest you think that whispers only happen once in a lifetime, um, so on March 25th, 1987, I was at the Cincinnati airport, and I had this really interesting 15-minute conversation with a woman, and then she got called up to uh, go on her plane, and I asked for her phone number before she left, and we celebrate our 25th anniversary this fall. <laughs> um, my tag, the, the passion part, it says, for Jean. Oh, is that sweet? All right. Um, and the, the Neuralco triple header, several years ago, and this, this was, I, I was working in industry, and I dropped my Neuralco triple header on the floor, and it shattered into a bunch of pieces. And because of that, partially because of that, I made the decision at the end of the year that it was time to leave industry and go to work in academics. It's a long story. <laughs> um, one more whisper, and then I'll, I'll move to my conclusion. One more whisper is I met a really interesting person in the last two weeks. And when he was a freshman at college, he had an internship. And in that internship, uh, the CEO of the company asked him if he would be interested to work with him on making some slides for uh, one of his presentations. And so he said, yeah, sure, I'll do that as an intern. 
And he ended up growing up, that, that little whisper that that started off, he ended up growing up and now he's coached pretty much every single TED speaker that you saw come out today. That's an interesting whisper that turns into a, to, to a, a major life changer too. So a question, there's two questions I'd like to leave you with. And you really can't answer these right now, which is an interesting thing. One is, what are the whispers in your life? And are you listening? Thank you.